If you watch the movie Saltburn, then this video is for you. I posted this video on TikTok a while ago about the various literary references in Saltburn and it blew up. You guys all wanted to know what kind of literary references came up in Saltburn, so I thought I would do a video about it today. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kate and I am currently a master's student in literature and arts at the University of Oxford part-time while also working full-time. And when I first watched the film Saltburn, I was really struck by the amount of literary references that came through in the film. And with interviews that the director, Emerald Fennell, did, you could really see that she drew on sort of with a lot of the interviews that Emerald Fennell did, you could really see that she drew on a lot of gothic references in literature. And so I thought I'd talk about a few that just kind of crossed my mind and share them with you guys. So I've already spoken about Brideshead Revisited on my TikTok account and I will leave the details of all of this in the description box below. But Brideshead Revisited is basically a parallel novel of Saltburn itself, just with quite a few different twists. The plot for Brideshead Revisited basically parallels that of Saltburn. Brideshead Revisited is a novel by Evelyn Wong and it was published in 1945. It follows the protagonist, Charles Ryder, who attends Oxford University and befriends the very eloquent and flamboyant Lord Sebastian Flight. Sebastian introduces Charles to his eccentric friend group, which includes a haughty Anthony Blanche. Sebastian then takes Charles to his aristocratic home, Brideshead, where he meets and has a love affair with Sebastian's sister, Julia. Now the parallel here is quite evident. The first part of the novel and the film Saltburn take place in Oxford, where Sebastian and Charles meet, as well as where Oliver and Felix meet. And they both come from different classes and the, the wealthier of the, of the pair, Sebastian slash Felix, introduces Charles slash Oliver to his ancestral home, his aristocratic ancestral home, Brideshead or Saltburn. In Brideshead Revisited, Julia, the sister, also really resembles Venetia in Saltburn in a lot of ways. She's this beautiful sister who has a mind of her own and is also kind of in this dark sort of torrented place where she's trying to navigate the constraints of her life versus what she wants to do. Farley in Saltburn is also a really great parallel to Anthony Blanche in Brideshead Revisited. Apart from both of them being homosexual, they are split image characters of each other in the jealousy that they experience when Oliver slash Charles comes into the picture. This book also reflects that sort of gothic aesthetic that Emerald Fennell was going for in Saltburn. She mentions that the British Gothic theme of the film really comes through quite strongly in the country house, the idea of romance, friendship, sort of darkness all twisted up together, very much fits the theme of this book and a lot of the other books that I'll talk about in this video. Another book that is like this that Fennell refers to directly is The Go-Betweeners. This novel is about a young middle-class boy at boarding school who becomes friends with a very rich aristocratic boy and invites him back to his home for the summer. The protagonist then becomes this go-betweener between the local farmer and the daughter of the house and is embroiled in this forbidden romance that he doesn't quite understand. Now, the aesthetics of these books, The Go-Betweeners and Brideshead Revisited, are quite evident in Saltburn itself. The Go-Betweeners is an interesting parallel because Oliver's character is the go-between between all of the characters in Saltburn, except 
he knows exactly what he's doing. He flirts with Elspeth, he breaks down Venetia's walls, quite literally, and he manipulates Felix and Farley. Oliver does get embroiled in the lives of the residents of Saltburn and in their romantic lives quite significantly. He is the go-betweener between most of these characters. It's very interesting to see him be this sort of initial outsider that, that then comes into the center of this family unit and becomes that core piece that kind of sits itself in. Another very gothic themed novel that Fennell talks about in interviews is Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca and the gothic sort of murdery mystery vibe that comes with Rebecca also comes into Saltburn quite heavily. I also found it very very interesting in the latest film of Rebecca and Saltburn, the moment of Oliver's birthday takes place on the staircase, that very awkward moment when they're all singing to him and no one knows his name. The fact that it's taking place on the staircase is exactly the moment of the re of reveal where the new Mrs. De Winter comes down the staircase dressed as the old Mrs. De Winter and it's this very pivotal moment in both of the films where things start to go a bit haywire. It also mirrors this idea of the awkwardness of a newcomer into an aristocratic background or an aristocratic family and that sort of power play dynamic, that shift in power play is really really interesting as you see in the next half of the films in, Sol in both Saltburn and in Rebecca things significantly change at that pivotal point and I think that's quite fascinating. With both of these shots being on the on the stairs, the idea is that both of these characters, Oliver and the new Mrs. De Winter, are mid-social climb on the stairs. I just think that's such an interesting place for Fennel to place Oliver in the film. The famous or rather infamous graveyard scene comes directly out of Emily Bronte's Withering Heights. The twisted love story between Heathcliff and Kathy concludes when Kathy passes and Heathcliff is mourning at her grave. In his grief, he digs through the earth to get to Kathy. This is mirrored in Oliver's actions when he digs at Felix's grave. There's this connection that he has with Felix that is haunted and unnatural, very much like what Kathy and Heathcliff had in Withering Heights. And it's twisted and it's dark and it's it's far more evocative than I think a lot of people realize. The other scene which maybe is quite evident, the scene between Venetia and Oliver, is a significant nod to one of the most gothic novels of the time, which is Dracula by Bram Stoker. This novel, when it was released, caused quite a stir, naturally, because of its sort of supernatural, uncanny setting and content, which we also experience in Saltburn at this present time. The idea that Dracula preys on a female character in the book, in the novel, is evidently paralleled in Saltburn. And as he draws on this female, he increases his power, much like Oliver seems to increase his power of manipulation over the family once he starts picking at its victims, Venetia being the first. This might be a little bit of a stretch, but I thought it was really, really interesting at the end of the film that Oliver goes to collect all of the stones with the family's names on them and displays them on the puppet show piece, which I thought was so, so interesting. And I thought that this could be a bit of a stretch of a nod to Frankenstein by Mary Shelley 
the idea of control and the godlike attitude that Oliver has that ultimately ends in the demise of these characters. But in Shelley's novel, it means the madness and demise of the creator, whereas in Saltburn it is quite the opposite. And that sort of uncanny nature that seems to penetrate through all of these novels kind of sits with us at the end of the film where we, we are thinking, oh, well, it's so odd that he got away with it at the end. But, um, you know, it ends off with such a banger of a track that we are all just this is filled with a sense of euphoria, which is really uncanny and really great that, that Fennel has adapted that so, so well. But finally, what I want to draw attention to is the allegory of Midsummer Night's Dream in Oliver's birthday party. This is obviously the theme that Elizabeth recommends when she plans the party for Oliver. Elspeth dresses up as Tatiana, the queen of the fairies, who directs these dances and, and invites her fairies to be joyous and dance and sing and have a little bit of a party, which is exactly what happens in the film. But she also seems to collect these, these souls. She collects a baby in Midsummer Night's Dream that that Puck eventually steals away from her. But in this sense, Elizabeth does collect souls. She collects, I um, can't remember the character's name now, but she collects Carrie Mulligan's character in the beginning of the film. She collects Varley and then she eventually collects Oliver. But whereas the other characters are so dependent on her, Oliver turns this to his own benefit. One of the humans, Nick Bottom, is turned into a donkey and Farley is dressed as the donkey in Saltburn, which mirrors the idea that he has now become the outsider. He is no longer part of this fairy realm. He is a human who has been excluded and who has been transformed and thus shunted out. Not only is Farley indebted to Elizabeth for his room and board, he acts just as entitled as Nick Bottom does in the play. Tatiana initially indulges him, but then eventually she pushes him out when his true form is revealed. And as in the play, or as in Saltburn and in the play, Oliver slash Puck reveals his true form. I believe that Oliver's dress kind of tends to his idea of being Puck, the mischievous trickery that is Robin Goodfellow. And I think this is so interesting. I think the idea of him being dressed like the forest, uh, like an animal of the forest is very, very interesting. His sort of sense of camouflage but yet his master trickery as he goes about his awful deeds in Saltburn later on is really evident in this mirroring of the party with Midsummer Night's Dream. Another view here is that Felix is the changeling child that Tatiana holds on to and cares for. Puck eventually steals this child away. In a similar way, Oliver steals Felix from Elspeth. There are also many numerous references to Greek and Roman mythology within this film. The idea of the maze in the party and the minotaur is all part of mythological references that while I know a little bit about, I don't know nearly enough, but I would be happy to explore that more if that is something that you would be interested in. But each time I think about this film, I think of another literary reference, and I'm pretty sure there's some that I've missed out on. So if you have any others that you think that I have missed, please do leave them in the comments below. Let me know what you think about this plethora of literary references in the film Saltburn. And let me know if you enjoyed this video. I often think of 
I often have these ideas of literary overlays that are in films or TV shows or even musicians. Hosier, for one, is a massive literary invoker. So if you guys like this video, please do give it a thumbs up, like, subscribe, comment, show your appreciation because I can tell you it means so, so much to me. And thank you all for being here. I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you all soon. Bye.